Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Osteoporosis Canada's web webinar, Cooking for One or Two. My name is Tracy Napoli, Director of Fund Development and Marcom at Osteoporosis Canada, and I will be your moderator for today. This presentation will provide general information about cooking and food knowledge. It is not intended as individualized health or nutrition advice. If you have questions about nutrition, consult a physician or registered dietitian. Please note, during the cooking demonstration, you can enter your questions by clicking the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. In addition to answering some of the questions that were submitted in advance, we will also attempt to answer those submitted during this live webinar within the time available. Before we begin the cooking demo, just a few points on nutrition for healthy bones. Nutrition, especially calcium, plays an important role in preventing and managing osteoporosis. In people who have healthy bones, adequate calcium intake on a daily basis is necessary to maintain bone health. Vitamin D also helps to increase the absorption of calcium, ultimately building stronger bones. Protein is also essential to bone health and is necessary to build and repair bone tissue. Visit Osteoporosis Canada's website to find the amount of calcium and vitamin D you need daily. If you have questions about calcium or vitamin D, consult a physician. Today's cooking demo featured recipes are spring potato and pea soup and patty melt for two. You can easily find both of today's featured recipes and others by visiting osteoprosis.ca forward slash recipes. Today, our presenter for cooking for one or two is Emily Richards, a professional home economist, freelance food writer, chef and cookbook author, who also enjoys culinary instruction for home cooks who want to learn more and have fun in the kitchen. She is the author and co-author of nine cookbooks, which include topics from Italian cuisine, weeknight dinners, glycemic index diets, and comfort foods. Emily writes and develops recipes for cookbooks, print, and online publications and websites that include everyday cooking and healthy eating. Please welcome Emily. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you so much um, for everyone's patience. And I'm so glad to be here. And we are going to be cooking some delicious food this afternoon that um, is super easy to make and also for smaller households. So if you are cooking for one or cooking for two, these are great recipes to have on hand. And you might actually have everything already at home, which is fabulous. So um, as you can see, I have all the ingredients out ready to use. So hopefully, um, when you do go ahead to make these, um, you might have the ability to have everything out in front of you too. It's a great way to get ready for cooking because then you'll know if you're missing any of the ingredients. So I always like to do that. You don't need all the bowls necessarily, but do have the ingredients out before you get started so that you're not looking for anything last minute. Now, if I happen to do that today, you'll see me running around the kitchen trying to locate something. <laughs> so hopefully I'm prepared. So we're going to start off with the soup today and it's the spring pea and potato soup. And what I love about this is that it does make a smaller amount and you have the option to serve it chunky or smooth and I'm going to show you both today. So we're going to get started with a little bit of butter. And if you wanted to, you could certainly use some oil here in place of the butter. But oftentimes when I'm using milk to add creaminess, I do like to start off with butter just because it has that nice addition of creaminess as well. So I'm going to put my burner on, usually about a medium heat is where I like to start, especially because we're gonna be sauteing off some onions. Now with soups, onions are a great flavor starter because they really do add a little bit of flavor that goes a long way. So we're just using a small onion and I've already gone ahead and diced it up. And that's because if you do serve this chunky style, you wanna have the onion fairly small, okay? So I just want to make sure that that's melting nicely. And I will at times, not to worry, um, show you what is inside this pot. I know it's hard to see because I don't have an overhead camera. 
um, but I will tilt the pot so that you can see what's going on, okay? All right, and I will try to keep it nice and tidy so that um, you can see everything that I'm doing. So we want to take, cook the onions, get a little bit of the water out, as well as start to get a bit of flavor. So we're not necessarily looking for um, some color on these onions, but we definitely want to get them nice and soft, okay? So peas, that is kind of our main goal for this pea soup. And peas are something that um, are an early summer, fabulous um, produce product that you'll find. So you can use um, fresh peas for this, but I'm using frozen peas because oftentimes most of us have frozen peas in the freezer. If you're not using them to cool off your hurt shoulder, um, they're fabulous to add as a side dish, um, as a vegetable, but even better in soups and stews or rice. So it's great as a side dish. So here, this soup is gonna play the part of the biggest flavor because it is the main flavor. So I can hear my onions starting to sizzle away. And that's when I'm going to add some salt and pepper as well. Now, if you are on a reduced sodium diet, you can hold back on the salt. And here's why, because we are gonna be using a little bit of broth in here as well, if your broth is um, already salted, you can hold back on the salt. If you're using a no sodium or reduced sodium broth, you can always add that salt later so you can season it. But I'm gonna add some salt and pepper. You could definitely add the pepper. And if you want a little bit of a kick here, some hot pepper flakes would be really nice to get started with those onions as well. All right, it's gonna smell great in here. So if you are gonna make this later, you'll definitely be happy. Here are my peas. So I, as I said, I'm using two cups of frozen peas. You can let them thaw a bit or you can use them frozen right away, okay? Because they are going to simmer in the soup, not for long. I love soups that don't take too long. Um, if they're frozen, it's totally okay. Now, if you had some other vegetables um, that are green, and right now, seasonally, um, we are in asparagus season. So you can definitely use two cups of chopped asparagus here in place of the peas and they would be absolutely delicious. Now with the peas I'm also going to add a potato. This is one large potato that I peeled and diced and again I've diced it up fairly small because if I do need this chunky I want it to fit on my spoon. So in goes my potato. Now potatoes are something that you can actually get ahead, done ahead of time. So if you're last minute peeling that potato and dicing and you wanna get it done a little bit ahead of time, you can simply peel it, dice it, and keep it in some cold water so that when you're ready to make the soup, you can just drain it and add it right in. So I wanna make sure that that's coated nicely with the onion. And then we're also gonna add a fresh herb. So you saw my nice big bunch of parsley here. I love using parsley. And right now my garden is full of parsley. So I love using it in a lot of different recipes. So here I'm using two tablespoons of chopped pressed parsley. Reason being is parsley is a great herb to have on hand and it's a great way to add fresh flavor. So if you are a smaller household, buying a lot of fresh herbs might not be a good option for you, but parsley is something that will last quite a long time in the refrigerator. And it freezes beautifully as well. So if you buy a big bunch, if you're not a gardener and you don't have any in the garden, you can simply bring it home, wash it well, dry it in some paper toweling or a clean tea towel, and then wrap it in paper towel or that clean tea towel, and then store it in the refrigerator. So that will help keep the moisture away from the leaves. Once that paper towel gets wet, what you want to do is unwrap it and wrap it with some fresh paper toweling so that that moisture doesn't start to deteriorate those fresh herbs and that will make them last so much longer. If you already know that you're not going to use them for a couple of weeks, save some in the refrigerator and take the rest, chop it and freeze it. So all you have to do is grab it and throw it into your soups and stews while you're cooking. It's a fabulous flavor. So now what I'm going to do is add my liquid. I'm using vegetable broth so that this could be a vegetarian dish. If all you have is, have is chicken broth, that would work beautifully as well. If you don't have either, this will work equally well with water, okay? You might just need a little bit more seasoning. So I'm gonna add my vegetable broth. And oftentimes I get a lot of questions about broth. 
If you, as I mentioned, if you're on a reduced sodium diet, look for those types of reduced sodium or no salt added broths. Or make your own, super easy to make. Just keep all your vegetable cuttings, so your onion skins and your celery ends, your carrot tops, all that. You can freeze it all, put it in a pot of water and simmer it for about 30 minutes and you have a beautiful vegetable broth that you can freeze and use whenever you want. So it's really, really handy to have on hand. We're also gonna add one cup of milk and that's what's gonna help give us that nice creaminess and a beautiful color to this soup. And I'm using whole milk. So if you have a 2% milk, that will work beautifully. If you use 1% milk, it'll start to look like it's a little bit breaking up as you're cooking it. So the higher fat milks are fabulous for this because it will give you that really nice smooth texture, almost thinking that you're using cream. So I'm gonna add my milk in there. All right. So I'm gonna give this a stir. And then I want to bring this just to a very gentle simmer and cover it slightly. And we're gonna let it cook for about 10 minutes because we need the potatoes to cook through and the peas to also cook through. All right, so I'm gonna move this to my back stove because we're gonna be cooking the other recipe as well too. But I will have to not forget about this because I'm sure many of you know, as soon as you put milk on the stove and walk away from it, it can boil over. All right, so I'm just gonna move this to the back and keep it on fairly low heat so that it can simmer away. And we will take an eye, take, an, take a look at it as we move along. I will take a look at my phone and see if there's any other, any questions that have popped up here. All right, some great questions. So um, one question that um, we also got the last time we did a webinar was if the recipes will be available and if this whole webinar will be available, and it certainly will be. Um, you'll be able to find everything on the website um, after we're done. So if there's a point that you forgot, you can always go back and look at it, as well as the recipes. They'll be on osteoporosis.ca as well. All right, so here is another great question. Are there options for the milk? And the butter. I already told you the one about the butter. So you can use um, a neutral oil here. So canola oil is a great one to use. Um, for the milk, you can use non-dairy beverages that are fortified with calcium. So that is a great way to still get that rich creaminess um, and get your calcium too. So it's a fabulous substitute. So it, as we're moving along, if you do have any questions, please feel free to post them on the Q&A um, on your screen and just type it in and we'll be happy to answer them as we're moving along. Um, I'll just keep getting the little reminders on my phone. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about cooking for those smaller households. I know sometimes it can be a little bit daunting, um, buying the groceries, coming home, prepping the meals. Um, oftentimes when I talk to my mom, she says she just doesn't feel like cooking and that's okay. Um, but it is important to enjoy a good meal and, and cook. But you don't have to cook every day. You could cook something one day to cover you for a few days. And there's a few things that you can keep on hand. So already with the soup, we already know that there's a few things that you can keep in your fridge and freezer. So milk definitely can be something in your fridge. And the vegetable broth, there's so many options for you to purchase that you can keep them in the refrigerator or in the shelf. So there's some great pantry staples. There's also um, onions are a great one to keep on hand because of that additional flavor that they add. Peas, again, in the freezer, great way to go. Now, sometimes if you have to buy larger items, you might take them home and think, I can't eat all of this and I don't have enough people in the house to eat it all. So, but you still wanna buy it because it's a great deal. No one can give up a big deal. I know, I can't. Um, so what I recommend is, this lovely scale. It's not very expensive. It's just something that comes in super handy for smaller households and larger households. But what it does is it helps you portion out a larger product or what you need. For example, we're going to move on to our patty melt and it calls for eight ounces or 227 grams of lean beef, ground beef. Now it's very, very rare unless you're going to a butcher and you specifically ask for that amount of beef that that's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get larger packages. So what you can do is come home, take that package and divide it up. 
and put the rest in the freezer so that you have it either to make the recipe again or to use it in something else. So it's a great little inexpensive item to have that becomes very, very useful. You just have to kind of get into the routine of it. Another thing that a lot of people feel as, they're, as they are cooking in the kitchen, sometimes they don't like being in the kitchen as long. Either they don't want to stand at the stove for as long or they find the ordeal of the food preparation just a little bit too daunting. There's so many great convenience items that you can get in the grocery store. One of them is pre-cut vegetables. So you can find them in the produce section or in the freezer section and that's something that's super handy. So in the freezer section, you can find chopped onions um, or chopped carrots. So a great way to just scoop some out of the freezer and add them and get cooking. So you have less time standing at the kitchen preparing and you can simply just be at the stove cooking. If you don't wanna be at the stove, do what I do. I have a little um, stove top portable burner that I bring to the counter. You can sit at the counter and do your cooking at the counter after you've done your prep. So there's lots of great options to relax and still enjoy what you love, which is good food and even preparing food in the kitchen, um, just changing it up a little bit slightly. All right, let's move on to our patty melt. I love patty melts. Um, I worked in restaurants many years ago, and that was one of the specials that I always made sure I put on because it was always a big seller. Um, I was lucky enough to work at one restaurant where I was um, allowed to recreate their seniors menu, which I loved because it made me um, think about all those retro classic foods that I loved and I knew that would hit home with a lot of people. And patty melts have been around for a really long time. They kind of started um, as early as the early 40s. Um, there's been um, some food history that, you know, historians that love to do that research and find out how old things are. I've just added a little bit of canola oil to my skillet here. Don't want my burner to be too hot. And I'm gonna start cooking my mushrooms and onions for that patty melt. So a patty melt in simplest terms, I'm using eight ounces of sliced mushrooms. Again, I didn't slice them, I just bought them sliced. So you don't have to do that. Um, a patty melt in simplest terms is a cheeseburger in sandwich bread. Um, typically you'll see it with rye bread. Um, I love marble rye, so anything, any sandwich that I can have on marble rye is a big favorite of mine. I'm also adding one small onion slice, just like that. And it was a cheeseburger in sandwich bread. Sometimes it had onions, sometimes it didn't. It's changed over the years and a lot of restaurants took it as their own. So they would add sauces to it. They would add different vegetables to it. They would also change the shape of the patty. Now, in my opinion, the patty melt should be an oval because rye bread is typically that large oval shape and you want it to cover all the bread. I don't know about you, but I don't like my burgers with all bun and no burger. So definitely that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to shape our patties into an oval. But we wanna have a good base. So I mentioned the onions on the patty melt. Um, I really like mushrooms. So I'm doing a mushroom and onion mix. If you're not a fan of mushrooms, you could simply just saute the onions on their own. But we are gonna season them as well with some salt and pepper, okay? If you're not a fan of salt and pepper, not to worry, you can leave them out. But that little bit of salt in the mushrooms also helps start to get some of the water out of the mushrooms. So oftentimes when you're cooking mushrooms, what ends up happening is we don't cook them long enough. So they're kind of soft and spongy. Here we're looking for that nice golden brown color and the water to cook out of them. Mushrooms are about 95% water. So we definitely want to have a nice textured mushroom for our sandwich. Okay, I'm going to peek back at my soup just to make sure that it's simmering away here. I'm going to turn it up just a bit. I'm so worried of having it boil over because, you know, all these things always happen when there's a camera on. All right, so we're going to give that a stir. I'm going to check my phone, see if there's any other questions. And then we're going to start making our patty melt. All right. Great question, guys, I love this. If, this is a question about the soup. Um, if you use evaporated milk, do you adjust the quantity? I actually use equal amounts because um, I have made the soup with evaporated milk. Now, if you're not, there are people that don't like the flavor of evaporated milk, I would use about three quarters of a cup. 
but you could definitely use a cup. And if you find that um, because evaporated milk, which I actually happen to have a can of right here um, in my pantry shelf, it is uh, 350 mil. So it's a little bit more than a cup. So if you want to, you can actually use the whole can and then just make the difference with the vegetable broth. So um, you'd use less vegetable broth and then you can use the whole can of evaporated milk. Now, the other option is to use the one cup that you'll need for the recipe and then save the evaporated milk to add to your coffee because it's absolutely delicious or make a little pan sauce um, next time you're making something, okay? Because it's a great addition. That was a great question. I'm just gonna see if there's another question that I can add that has to do uh, with the soup. Actually, this one has to do with the soup and the patty melt. How long can you store onions? And where should you store them to last long? Well, I don't know if you can see on my back counter there, I have a basket of onions. Um, and I actually leave them out on my counter away from the window. Um, I know it looks like it's in front of the window, but it's actually in the back corner and it's a cool corner of the kitchen. Because I use them every day, I want them accessible. If you don't use them very often as long as they're in a cold place doesn't mean the refrigerator but I'll tell you why you would put them in the refrigerator um, that's perfect so I've seen people keep them under their kitchen sink um, in that cupboard I've also seen them in cupboards beside the dishwasher those are two places that you want to stay away from when it comes to storing your onions and garlic reason being is your hot water pipe runs through there so it can get a little steamy and that bit of moisture will start to increase the sprouting time of your onions. So you'll start to see those nice green sprouts, means that they want to be planted and they want to grow again. Um, so definitely keep them in a cool place. Now, in the refrigerator, why would you keep them there? I'm going to turn this back down. Do a little spin back. Um, why would you keep them in the refrigerator? I'll tell you why. When I worked at one of the restaurants I worked at, I was a prep cook. And what that meant was, Part of my prep for the day was I would go in in the morning, pull out a big 50 pound sack of onions and start peeling and chopping them. And I would cry and cry and cry. So um, if you've ever experienced that, I feel your pain. I don't do that anymore, um, years later. My glasses help, but here's what I learned when I was working in the restaurant, in the kitchen. I would put that bag of, of, of onions in the fridge, the walk-in refrigerator, the night before, knowing that I'd come in in the morning and have to cut them, and I wouldn't cry. So having them chill kind of chills the cells with all those lovely aromas and that come out and make you start to cry. So if you know you're chopping a lot of onions, French onion soup would be a great example. Um, just keep your, your onions in the refrigerator overnight so the next day you can peel them and slice them and that will help. A sharp knife will definitely help too. But right now, we're going into fresh onion season, and that's really hard. So if they're super fresh onions, you should be grateful that you're crying because you're getting a great local product. All right, so these are gonna cook still for a bit longer. We're getting a little bit of color. I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, we got some nice browning happening on our mushrooms and onions. It smells wonderful, by the way. This is a great way to get people into the kitchen, just saute up some onions and mushrooms. I'm just gonna turn this down a little bit while we start to make our patty melt. So we are going to add some great ingredients to our patty melt and we're going to replicate um, oftentimes if you're making burgers or patty melts or anything like that um, what ends up getting used is French onion soup mix and that's actually one of the classic ingredients of most patty melts of years gone by. Um, so we're not going to use that we are going to kind of recreate our own French onion soup mix. We have the onions that we're going to serve with the patty um, but we're going to add some seasoning to our, I'm using um, a nice lean ground beef. You can use extra lean here too if you want. The other options here are endless. So if you love ground turkey or chicken, you could use that here. Pork or veal would work. And if you wanted to, you could use a vegetarian ground. So a Beyond Meat would work here as well. So whatever family that you're serving. Um, and if you wanted to, you could make one with beef. And you, so actually you make two with beef, two patties with beef, and then if you're buying a pound of ground, ground beef, you can use the other two um, in a different ground. Um, so whether it's ground turkey and 
then you can freeze the other half and make them all over again another time, okay? These patties do freeze, by the way, so if you wanted to make them, shape them, and put them in the freezer, you definitely can do that. I would leave them in the freezer for up to about a month, because after that, I think you'll forget about them. <laughs> I know I do. All right, so let's add some seasoning to our beef. We are going to use some onion and garlic powder. Now, I'm going to specify here powder as opposed to salt. Um, there is a difference. Garlic salt and garlic powder are very, very salty. We're just using half a teaspoon of each. So the powder will just give you the flavor of the onion and the garlic. There we go. So we'll get that in there. Then we're also going to add a little bit of Worcester or Worcestershire, however you would like to say it. Um, is going in and that's going to help give us a little bit more seasoning as well. And we're going to add some binding to this. So typically in a patty you see breadcrumbs, um, oatmeal, those types of things, but we're actually going to use skim milk powder as our binding. The bonus here being is that we're going to kick up our calcium in these patties, which is really, really important um, because we really want to build that bone strength. I know Walking, moving, it's really important to me. So having enough calcium is super, super important. So we're gonna add, this is just a quarter cup of skim milk powder. And if you're wondering why I would have skim milk powder around, well, let me tell you, it is fabulous for so many things. Here, we're gonna use it in the um, patties and I'm just gonna put some gloves on. I have gloves in my kitchen uh, because it's just so much easier to pull off gloves and answer a phone or pick something else up instead of running over to the sink. So I have gloves in my kitchen all the time and it's perfect for something like this. So I'm just mixing up everything here. So you saw how simple that is and it actually has quite a wonderful aroma. And you can see that's eight ounces of beef. It's not very much, but it's perfect for the two patties we are gonna need. So how do we divide it up? I'm just gonna put it in one bowl and then kind of divide it in half and eyeball it. And if you want, you can pull out that scale again, put some plastic wrap on it and divide it up, okay? So I'm gonna just move the bowl aside. And what I'm gonna do is just in front of the camera here, I'm gonna show you how to shape that patty. I know it may sound silly, but what I'm gonna do is make it into an oval shape. And I'm gonna make it fairly large because I want it to be the size of my rye bread, okay? There we are, there's my one oval patty. And then I'll do the other side, the other half into an oval patty. And this is also considered a one pan meal because we're actually going to be put, cooking our patties in the same pan where our mushrooms and onions were. There, there's our two oval patties. I'm gonna put this in the sink, take my gloves off, and I'm gonna hop back over to my skillet with my onions and garlic. And they look great. I'm actually gonna bring them over to this camera. Hopefully you can see that, I don't know if you can see. You see that there? There we are. So it's got some really nice golden brown color. And then I'm going to add a splash of balsamic vinegar. Okay. Now, if you don't have balsamic vinegar, you don't have to add it. But what it does is it gets absorbed right into our mushrooms and gives it a really, really nice flavor. You won't even be able to see that liquid from the balsamic. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to scrape out my mushrooms and onions here, nice and steamy. There we go. And then I'm going to put my skillet back on the heat so that I can cook my pediments. All right, I'm just going to check on that soup again sure that we're not boiling over and I want to check the texture of the potatoes so I'm going to actually bring 
the pot over. And where can I show you this pot? I think I'm going to show you on the big screen here. If I can get the ladle full out. There's some nice diced potatoes and our peas in there. And I want to make sure that those potatoes are cooked. So I'm just going to get a little paring knife, just like so. And I'm going to take the paring knife and poke poke the potatoes just to make sure that they're nice and tender, okay? I think it needs maybe another minute. I've been going back and forth with that temperature, so just needs about a minute to finish cooking. There we go. And then I'm gonna ladle up some of that soup for us. All right, so we're going to cook our patties. I'm gonna get my skillet back on, and I'm gonna put those patties in the pan. So what we're looking to do is um, we're going to absorb some of the flavor that was left in the pan from the onions and the mushrooms, okay? And these aren't gonna take too long because they're fairly thin patties. We'll just do that, okay? And we wanna get a really nice crust on them. So what that means is it's gonna start to caramelize on the outside and give us almost like a little crunch on that patty, which is going to be super delicious. We're going to save our mushrooms and onions. And I'm going to flip my board so that when I'm done with everything, I can show you what it looks like. There, we have a nice clean board there to work from. All right, I'm gonna bring our soup back over because I wanna show you, I'm gonna ladle out a bowl of our chunky soup. So for those of you that don't have a blender or don't want to use an immersion blender, you can serve up your soup chunky style, which is one of my favorites. I really like having the option to do that. There we go. So there's a bowl of our chunky soup. It almost feels a little bit like a chowder. There's, I'll put it in front of the camera on the Board. I'm going to check my phone for any more questions. Oh, there's lots. All right. Um, okay, so a question about um, will the lean meat work as well? Um, when you're working with lean cuts, so chicken and turkey, very lean, extra lean beef, um, what you'll notice is that and this is, today I'm using extra lean beef. I usually find when I'm cooking with it, there's slightly less, um, it doesn't shrink as much. So it tends to retain its shape really, really well. And because we haven't added any liquid to it, so there's some burger patties that you'll add liquid to, that tends to evaporate and then your meat will shrink a little bit. So any of those lean cuts will typically stay the same shape. If you look at a little bit of a fattier cut, then that fat will also evaporate a little bit as it, the water from the fat will evaporate. So it tends to shrink a little bit. So um, I'm using extra lean and I always love having those lean options available. All right, um, what's another question here? Oh, a great question um, about using the frosted beef and why is it so watery? So I mentioned to you that you could freeze your leftovers. So if you are only using half of your package and then freezing it, you'll take it out and then you might notice that it'll have a little bit of a watery texture. The best thing to do is always defrost your meat in the refrigerator. So what that means, I know you may think that having ground beef, it will thaw a little bit quicker. I'm just flipping my patties here. You have a nice deep golden brown crust on them. Okay. Um, you may find that what that means is it only takes a couple of hours to thaw, but actually it will take anywhere from 12 to 24 hours, depending on um, if you left it in its original package or if you broke it up into smaller pieces. So if you are taking it home, so let's use ground beef as an example, and you're going to divide it out, you're going to use your scale and cut it in half and use eight ounces. Um, 
what I would actually do is press it out a little bit so it's thinner and put it in a Ziploc bag or um, an airtight container and freeze it that way so that when you put it in the fridge, it'll be thinner, it won't take as long to thaw. And when it's thawed in the refrigerator, it doesn't have that chance to build up all that condensation. So if you're leaving it on the counter, which you shouldn't, <laughs> at room temperature, that's what tends to happen. Now, there's also the option to put it in cold water in the packaging, but that's where, if it's not the proper packaging, you will get some water coming through and adding to it. If you're really noticing that it's really watery before you get started, just put it into a fine mesh sieve and let it drain a little bit before you get started. And that will help evaporate us or get rid of some of that, um, that thawing liquid as well, okay? All right, this smells so good in here. Uh, I know what I'm gonna eat. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna let these cook. Um, you saw that nice chunky version. I'm gonna leave a chunky version in the bowl and I'm gonna show you how to make it nice and smooth. <clears throat> so you can use a blender. I find using a blender sometimes uh, makes a big mess. <laughs> I have had kind of that overflow of the blender. Um, so I love using my immersion blender. So what that means is it's just a wand blender and all you do is go into your pot and you start moving it around. So because we have the potato in there, it will create a nice creamy texture. It will also magically, you see how lovely and white and creamy this soup is? By pureeing it, it will magically turn green. Not magically, we use peas and parsley, so of course it will turn green. But it will have a different texture. Um, the potato really adds to the creaminess with the addition of the milk. Puree going here. Let's give it a little tap. And because I used a large potato, which was about eight ounces, um, it has a really good balance of creaminess and smoothness. This is actually really nice cold too. You can serve it up as a vichyssoise, which is typically a cold potato soup. So with the peas in there, it's quite lovely. So I'm going to ladle up some soup. And we'll do a side-by-side -side comparison here. I'll leave that one there. And actually, I'll switch because you saw that one already. We'll do this. So check out that nice green color. I'm going to garnish it with a little bit of cheese because I think the creaminess of the soup with a little sprinkle of cheese is quite tasty. And you can do that with the other one as well. Okay. And while it's hot, that cheese will melt really, really nicely in there. All right, so I'm gonna set my soup pot here, and we're gonna continue on with our patties. I'm actually going to remove my burner because we're going to finish it off in the oven. So I have a little baking sheet here that I'm going to use. And I've toasted my rye bread, okay? That's what I'm gonna be using. You don't have to toast the bread, but I think it's better. It creates a nice barrier so that not all the juices wet the bread too much. And we're serving this patty melt open face. So again, traditionally, um, a patty melt would be, as a burger would be, with just two um, slices of bread. But we're serving it open face because the idea of this is to have it with a soup and a, and a sandwich so you can use your knife and fork and enjoy the bowl of soup. So if you wanna have it as a sandwich where you pick up and eat, just make sure that you have a couple extra slices of bread. So I'm just going to get some mayonnaise on my bread. And I'm using a light mayonnaise. I just always have light mayonnaise in my refrigerator, okay? A couple tablespoons, if you would like. Um, if you have Thousand Island dressing, that's another one I love using on here. You could use a little Dijon mustard if you're looking for something a little bit more spicy. That would be fabulous. Some more on here. There we go. And that's just going to add a little bit of a barrier for our bread, but also give us a little bit of sauciness before we add our mushrooms and onions. So I'm going to divide up our mushrooms and onions on here. And actually, I can build these on the other camera so that you can see what I'm doing. I'm just going to move our soups 
here by the parsley. And I will switch right here. There we go. So now you can see what I'm doing. A little bit closer, that's the wrong bowl. I need the mushrooms and onions on here. So I know it may look, have looked like a lot of mushrooms and onions, but this is a great amount for two people. Um, just dividing it up. If you wanted more onions, if you're a true onion lover, just increase that onion to a large onion as opposed to that small onion. Okay. There we go. And I can smell that little bit of balsamic. So wonderful. It's a great combination. And then I'm going to top it with my patty melts or the patties for the patty melts. There we go. Right on top. You can see it has that beautiful dark crust. Why is it so dark, you might be asking? Because remember, we added that balsamic vinegar into the pan with the mushrooms and onions in there. So that's what it picked up all that flavor, okay? We've got a mushroom jumper there. Tuck that back in. And then I'm gonna to top it with a little bit of cheddar cheese. So traditionally, it was processed cheddar cheese, which if you have it in the fridge, you could definitely use that. But I'm using a real slice of beautiful orange cheddar. You can also use white cheddar here. If you have a favorite, a different favorite cheese slice that you use, Gouda would be really nice here as well. If you want something a little bit more intense, a blue cheese would be absolutely delicious. So this goes into our oven. Just for about four minutes. It's at 400. You could broil it if you wanted to, um, but I find that if you broil it, the chances of it burning are a little high. So it's always a good idea. Just a nice hot oven for a few minutes and that will rewarm your bread, your toasted bread as well, if it's been sitting for a bit waiting for the patties to get on. So let's see if there's any other questions. <clears throat> All right. So are there some options here um, about not having gluten? Because sometimes incorporating that gluten, if you're watching your carbohydrates and things like that. So you definitely could just have the burger patty with the mushrooms and onions and cheddar. And I would actually just reverse what I did. I would put the patty on with my mushrooms and onions and then the cheese to hold everything in place. And that would be beautiful, um, beautiful served with a nice big green salad or served on some crisp iceberg. That would give you a really nice crunch in contrast to the, to the, um, the patty itself. And you'd still get all the benefit of the calcium in there with the skim milk powder, as well as um, the cheese on top. And then when you combine it with the soup, you're almost doubling the amount of calcium, which I think is super, super amazing. All right, there was another question here too. All right, um, what is the best type of pan to cook that um, patty melt? So I don't know if you noticed, but mine was a nonstick skillet. If you want, you could actually do the whole thing in a nonstick skillet that is oven safe. Now, mine has an older handle, which is not really oven safe. It's not heat proof. So that's why I don't put it in the oven. Um, so I, I switched it over to a baking sheet. But you could definitely do the onions and mushrooms, the patty, and then put your build your patty melt right in the same skillet and then put it into the oven. If you are using um, a regular skillet, you might find you might need to add a little cooking spray or a little bit of cooking oil before you put the patty melt on just so that it doesn't stick. I didn't use any because I had the residual um, little bit of water that was left from the mushrooms and onions, as well as that hint of flavor. So I definitely wanted to get that in the, uh, in the patty as well, which is really important. I'm just gonna see, I think there was a couple other questions that came in earlier that I wanted to answer. All right, just wanted to, oh, there was a question that came in earlier. Um, if you could use any type of seafood in place of the protein that we use. And I think what would work really well here are, they are available pre-made, but you could definitely make them at home, is a salmon or a whitefish patty. So you could use fresh salmon and just put it in a food processor and pulse it up a little bit so that it breaks up the protein. And then you can still add the calcium, uh, sorry, the skim milk powder in there to bump up your calcium, as well as the seasonings. 
and then shake your patties. That one's a little bit more delicate to cook as well as if you were using, let's say, um, any type of whitefish like a haddock or um, halibut, I would actually shake them and bake them in the oven um, so that they stay really, really nice um, with their shape. And then um, build the patty melts as you, as you would, which is fabulous. Now, another option many of you may know is a tuna melt. So it's basically the seafood option of um, our patty melt. And that's typically made with canned tuna, but you could also make it with canned salmon. And if you're doing that, make sure you mash up those bones in your salmon to get the benefit of the calcium of the bones. Let me check that patty melt and make sure the cheese is beautifully melted, just like that. I'll put it there for everyone to see the bubbling little cheese there. And then you would just serve it with, I'll bring the soup here too. And we would have our soup and sandwiches for two or for one. The fr the, you, if you have leftovers of the soup, they freeze beautifully too. So you can have some now and freeze some for later and then just let it thaw or pop it in the microwave to heat through. And if you wanted to, as I said, shape those patties, put them in the freezer, and then you can cook them later. Make sure you thaw them first before you pan fry them because it will be so much easier um, to deal with. So we don't have any more questions, but I do want to thank you all for joining me today. And the recipes will be available on osteoporosis.ca. And I'm really curious to know if you'll make these. So if you do make them, be sure to post your pictures and tag Osteoporosis Canada and we'll see what they look like. And hopefully you'll be able to enjoy them at home, on your own or with a friend. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Emily, for an informative cooking demonstration and for answering so many questions. Thank you also to all of you for joining us today. You can visit Osteoporosis Canada's website to use the Calculate Your Calcium tool to find today's recipes and to find a list of calcium-rich foods. You can also view the recorded version of this webinar on the OC Replay webpage, which will be available in the next 44, 40 hours. Also, an email with the replay version of this webinar will be sent out to all registrants within the next couple of days. Until next time, thank you and continue to stay connected and stay informed with Osteoporosis Canada.